um, the book of Genesis. I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. It's towards the beginning of the Bible. Did anybody see the the rocket launch this past week with Jeff Bezos, whatever, going up, going out, going out? I think it was kind of far out. <laughs> they had a they had a launch party. That was pretty cool. <laughs> All right, moving on. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Did you know baseball's in the Bible? Right there, it's just in the beginning. I'll keep going until you guys respond. Are you ready for it? Genesis 1, 1. Ready? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters... And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. There's a difference. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let, the, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters that were, were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together un unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw the, that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, and herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the, upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding and um, herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day. From the night, and to let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. In the evening, in the morning, were the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And, every, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and the beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle upon um, cattle after their kind, and, the, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, created he them, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you 
every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit um, the fruit of the tr of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat and to every beast of the field and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth wherein there is life I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. In the evening, in the morning, or the sixth day. We're going to start going through the book of Genesis, and it's going to take us 50 weeks. Because it's 50 chapters. I'm assuming that, which means it's going to be almost a year going through Genesis. Oh, what am I doing? All right. So we're going to go through this, but first, going through the book of Genesis will never exhaust everything that every chapter teaches. There are simple things that the chapter teaches. There are some hard things that the chapter teaches. There are things that will challenge what we believe in each chapter that we go through if we study hard enough and long enough. There are things you'll find in the Bible, if we read the Bible as being true, without any support of science, we're going to read some things that's contrary to what the science books teach teach us, even to what people say the science books teach us, if we just let the Bible read itself and read for itself, it will challenge everything about us. But gleaning simply means, I'm not going in, going in too deep, I'm just going to glean, which means there's some things throughout it we can pick and choose. It's such an abundance that we can glean from it out of the abundance that, this, that it's, the chapter is mentioning. So, in this, we're going to look at, first of all, like an overview of the chapter, and that is just the idea of creation itself. Take my gum out so I don't swallow it. That'll be nasty. All right. So the first thing we find is the call for creation. There is a reason for creation. Okay. So if you take your Bibles, go to keep your place here in Genesis one, so it's not hard to find. But go back to Psalms chapter one hundred and two. Psalms chapter one hundred and two. And we're going to look at verse number 25. Psalms 102, verse 25. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. Okay, so here it says in Genesis 1, 1, it says, In beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Here it says, In the heavens are the work of thy hands. So it says in verse number 26, they shall perish, but thou shalt, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture, thou shalt change them, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. The, the children of thy servants shall continue, and their seed shall be established before thee. So we see this where it says that God laid in, you know, from the beginning, or if thou, you know, of old thou hast laid, hast thou laid the foundation of the earth. So anytime you see the Bible, it's it's pretty important to kind of know that he's he's not saying there's multiple heavens because the Bible says in the beginning God created that what heavens singular. Okay, so obviously when you look at the heavens and it gives the heavens declare the glory of God, it didn't say the heaven declares us as the heavens. So when we start reading the Bible, we understand that he's containing all that's under the firmament as being the heavens. All that's there. So there's, the, there's where God sits, there's the firmament, and there's the open air where the birds fly. And we can read that, we understand that through Scripture, there's not vast millions of galaxies, millions of miles away. It's literally one contained space that God created, and it's the heaven. Okay? So here, when he's speaking about the heavens, it's about the heavens within the heaven. That's understandable. Okay? Just like a foundation, the Bible says God laid the foundation... In this verse 25, of all the house laid the foundation of the earth. But then, if we read over in, in what is it, Revelation, it says, before the foundations of the world, Christ was slain. Before the, you know, Christ was slain before the foundations of the world. So one is the foundations as far as the laying down, the pillars, as far as the order, the establishment. And what is actually talking about the, the foundation where God starts, or the building project, God starts the foundation. There's not multiple foundations he literally sets the foundation. Now, within the foundation, there are the pillars that make up the foundations, but it's all linked to one foundation. The Bible even clarifies this for us in the New Testament when God says that other men, no, no other, no, no, 
we can't build upon any other foundation but that which is laid, right? Paraphrasing it, what is that foundation? Jesus Christ, right? Christ Jesus. He is that foundation. That which all everything fits and joints together, all the pillars of the assembly, all the pillars is part of the foundations, but it's all hooked to the foundation. So it's not the Bible's not the Bible's not um repeating itself or using allegorical figure or literal. It's literal it's being literal when it says the foundation, and then it goes back to the foundations because you can have a foundation, but if you build a building without tying it to the foundation, it's going to falter. It's going to fail every time. That's why the wise man builds his house upon the rock, and he ties the building into the rock. That's when you look at a foundation. When, when you go to a, a construction site, the first thing they do is they figure out the cornerstone. Everything hinges on the cornerstone. Guess what? Christ is the cornerstone, right? So everything's got to fit, hinge on that. So before the foundation of the world, Christ was slain. Everything was for this. He sets the foundation. He sets the pivotal point. All things are created by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So you have to get the first thing done. You've got to get that foundation, and that is Christ is the chief cornerstone. He is the most important. Doesn't mean that the rest of the walls can go to pot, that as long as you have the cornerstone, everything else goes to fail. No, it means that every corner, the, the, the caddy corner distant, has got to match with this foundation. This one has got to fit with this foundation. This one over here has got to fit with this foundation. The four walls of any structure have to fit with this one foundation. Nothing else matters. If your foundation is not set in Christ, it doesn't matter how successful you'll be. It doesn't matter how smart, intelligent, talented, good-looking, rich. However, anything else you have in life, if your foundation is not set in Christ Jesus, everything will falter Everything will fail. It has to revolve and consist in Christ. Amen. So of old, thou hast laid the foundation. That's why we read over in Psalms 11, it says, if the foundations be destroyed, what, shall the right, what can the righteous do? You're basing your whole life on everything else, shifting sand, but if it's not based on Christ and him alone, you will suffer loss. <laughs> he has got to be the foundation. He is the foundation. Everything else we build upon are foundations. So the very beginning, Christ laid the foundation, God laid the foundation of the world, and it was built on Christ. Because without him, nothing else, nothing else lives. Nothing else moves or lives or has or being. So the first thing we'll find is with this call for creation is there is a spoken word. The spoken word is like God literally spoke it, let there be, and there was. But Aren't you glad that God didn't just speak the word? He actually got involved with it as well. The Bible says that he, with his own hands, did the work of his hands. It says here, in the heavens are the work of thy hands. Isaiah chapter 45, verses 1, 11 through 12. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his maker. And whose maker? The Lord? No, Israel's maker. And I find this interesting when it says the Holy One of Israel. Usually when he speaks of Israel as, as a... The Holy One of Israel, he's speaking back, kind of going back towards a, a country, which is a sheet, right? Nations, ships, items, they're always, objects and lands, they're always called she. They take a feminine pronoun, right? So when we, you know, I love America, she's a great nation, whatever. This is the good old ship, she's been good. You know, my car, she ain't what she used to be. The old gray mare, she, 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 right? So it's always, hey, she could use a few coats of makeup. And we're not talking about the wife, talking about the building. So it's like, hey, when it's speaking of this, the Holy One of Israel, and it goes back and says, and his maker. So this Israel is not talking about the nation, it's talking about the individual. It's talking about Isaac, right? Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, command it, command ye me. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts have I commanded. So this past week at the fair, I was watching this guy. I was walking back to the car, and, uh, you know, I got my booth set up at the fair. It's kind of good. Sometimes it's bad. And the guy was inside the food truck making a pizza pie. And if you have ever seen the actual, a real, like an actual Italian chef, whatever, actually making a pizza pie, Okay, so you get the dough, and he starts forming, and he starts making it, and he starts going like this, and he starts taking the dough, and he starts forming the dough, and pulling it out, and making it to the shape of the, of the pie. 
And he starts forming it out, and he's stretching it out, stretching it out, stretching it out. He takes the ball, and he stretches it into just the pan shape. He stretches it, stretches it, stretches it, every which way it goes. Finally, he gets it, and he lays it down, throws some flour on it, and then he takes the rolling pin, and he stretches it some more, and he stretches it some more. And soon, at the end of the day, he's got a flat, pan-shaped pie. Right? There it is, all flat. And on the the surface, he goes and sprinkles on the sauce, and then he sprinkles on the cheese, and then he puts on more ingredients. If you want, you know, a little bit more extra grease, he throws more extra cheese on that thing. If you want pepperoni, he lays the pepperoni. But he, he lays it all out, and he does that. The Bible says that God literally took the heaven, took the heavens and stretched them out. He says he stretched them out. That's pretty interesting. Um... They shall perish with our humanist. Uh, verse number. Um, yeah, forty-five. There he goes. And I even my um, and I even my hands have stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts have I commanded. So all the hosts of heaven, speaking about the stars, the sun, the moon, all that is what he put within the heavens. Right? It's not about the angel. Angels don't live in the. And this, where the stars and the moon and stars, the sun, star, the sun, moon and stars are. That's not where they live, right? So he puts all the hosts, all the heavenly hosts, all the stars, and the sun and moon. He puts it in the heaven, right? And all their hosts have I commanded. Hebrews chapter one, verse ten and twelve. He quotes back, and thou, and thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest, and they shall wax old as doth a garment. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Jeremiah 32, verse 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. So it says that God's hands, and even as up to his arms. Now he's using more than just his voice. His hands and his arms have made this. So we see this, there's a call for creation, and it didn't come from just him speaking it with his voice. He actually got involved with what he does as well. Aren't you glad that when God sends out, when Christ sends out the 70, when Christ sent out the 12, he also went? He was not just sitting back one day and sending out the people going slow winning, he, or going out to preach the gospel. He also preached the gospel. He, was, he gets involved in our lives. The Bible even says it this way, right? Matthew chapter 11, right? Come unto me, I'll either weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest, right? Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly, right? He says, come with me, put myself in the yoke with you, I'm going to serve with you. And that's why we're fellow laborers for Christ's sake. We're fellow laborers with Christ. We're fellow servants with Christ. Because he gets his hands in the work he does as well. So we find that the call for creation. Number two, we're going to look at the cause for creation. But going back to our place in Genesis chapter 1, but... While you're going back there, I'm going to go back to a very familiar passage all the way back here to the end of the book, the last book of the Bible, Revelation. Revelation chapter number four. So the cause for creation. It says in chapter four, verse 11 of Revelation. Chapter 4, verse 11. For thou art, uh, thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So all things were created for what purpose? For God's pleasure, right? For the Lord's pleasure. So God exists without worship. Right? A lot of times we get it mixed up. We think that the thing that receives worship becomes God or the thing that receives worship is somehow worthy of worship. But God exists without worship. He, in fact, he doesn't even need you or I to praise his name. He existed before the world began, self, self-existent. He doesn't need us to praise him. He doesn't need to be worshipped to be God. He is worshipped because he is God. Worship does belong to him because he is the creator and sustainer of all that exists. And ever since, because of that, nothing existed before him or without him. I know, duh, right? We got that part down. But what is, so what is the cause of creation? Did God create the world in order, did God create man in order to be praised? In order to have worship? God can, live, God can exist without worship. 
it's kind of hard sometimes for us to wrap our minds around that God doesn't need us to worship him. God desires us to worship him. He can exist without our worship. He can exist without the heavenly host. He can exist without the angels and the seraphim and, and all that's in there. God can exist without having any songs of hallelujah, praise the Lamb. He can exist without us singing all hell the power of Jesus' name. He can exist without that, but we can't exist without him. So what is the cause of creation? God created all things for his pleasure. He did it because he wanted to. He didn't create all things in order to redeem all things. He redeems all things because he created all things. Does that make sense? I'm not trying to like, preach some kind of crazy, oh, that's deep. Oh, let's put that into YouTube blog. He didn't create all things in order to redeem all things. He redeemed all things because he created all things. We, get, we have to go back and change our mindset from cause and effect. Right? God doesn't become God because we worship him as God. He receives praise because he is God. That's why he's specific about what he gets worship from. Colossians chapter 1. The Bible says that, he's, that he sustains all things. Without, you know, He is the creator of all things. He started all things. He sustains all things. All things are, are made by him. He has, he has a preeminence. John chapter 1, right? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was the beginning with God. And the world, and the world was made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Right? So we, look, we understand that Christ is involved. The Holy Spirit in, Roman, in uh, Roman, uh, Proverbs chapter 8 is involved with creation we understand that but he is a sustainer of all that is he didn't need mankind to be god so we find that there's 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 the we find that the the call for creation is how he created the cause for creation is why he created all things it's easy for us sometimes we come to we come to church and since we're here we might as well sing praises and because we sing praises to the Lord, he's exalted. Well, guess what? God's already exalted. We're going to put God upon the throne. He's already there. I, and, I, and I understand some people get this, they get this all mixed up, especially the Lordship Salvationists. They go and say, you've got to make Jesus Lord of your life. He already, he's already Lord. And he's Lord of your life, whether you recognize him as Lord of your life or not. Now, if you choose to obey him, Great. You're choosing out of, out of love. You're choosing out of desire, out of duty. But he's Lord of your life, whether you like it or not. And that's why every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. So it's a wrong position for these guys to get up there and say, well, you've got to make Jesus Lord of your life. Oh, okay. So I'm going to take Jesus, and I'm going to take him and manipulate him, and I'll put him where I want him to be, and boom, now he's Lord of my life. No, you just got to exalt. You just got to recognize him that he is. And I'm, not, and I'm not trying to say, okay, well, now this is where they get trapped up too. Well, if you make a mistake, then obviously he isn't Lord, because no one can say no Lord. Well, that's just dumb, faulty logic. Okay? We can say no to the Lord. That's why it's called disobedience. That's why it's called rebellion. So there's the call, there's the cause, but here's the conflict for creation. Psalms chapter 50. Let's go back to Psalms chapter 50 real quick. And you know what I find interesting too? Prove me wrong on this, if you if you would like. Um, or like they're saying on Twitter nowadays, this is what I'm going to say, now fight me. I'm like, really? But here's, here's and it's stupid, too, because these preachers are arguing today whether or not tacos are a good food. I'm like, really? This is not your strong point. Yeah, Psalms 50, and Psalms 150. Every time you see people worshiping the Lord or praising the Lord and bringing up what the Lord has done, it starts with creation. Every time. Do you think God wants us to worship him and remind, remind us of how he created things? It puts us back in, and it's like it takes us and puts us in a small microcosm. Like here, here we think we're the center of the universe and God's like, we think we're the center of all the world, all that exists around around us. And it's like, Obviously, I don't believe Men in Black is real stuff. I mean, there was one time these guys trying to light my eyes. But have you ever seen the movie Men in Black where they like take it and say this is all what's going on, and then it, it zooms out 
to like to like you know like microscopic. We think all that exists in our little world, and there's so much of a big world out there, and it's like whoa, it's really sci-fi. But when we step and think about it, there's a conflict for creation. There's a conflict for your attention. There's a conflict for our soul. And Psalms 150 verse six. I'll read the whole chapter. Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. By the way, do you know where His sanctuary is? Yeah, you could call the church his sanctuary, where we are right now. But really, his sanctuary is his pavilion. The Bible says darkness is his pavilion. God dwells in darkness, where no man can come to. No mortal man can come to where he is. Where does God exist? Where does God live? It says it in Isaiah. You can look for it. Praise God in his sanctuary. Okay? Okay. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with a sound of trumpet. Praise him with a psaltery and harp. Praise him with a timbrel and dance. Praise him with string instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. So the whole purpose of creation was to praise the Lord, to please God. Everything. So now, here we have all of creation. It's everything is going well. Everything is going exactly how God created it. And then you insert a wild card. Man's will. I do not believe in free will. I don't believe in Calvinism either. Okay, But I don't believe in free will because I believe that our choice is limited. We don't have an open empty box. We open up a cover and say, this is all we have. That's still limited will. I believe that man's will is always going to be, by default, our default will is always going to be against God. Every time. God says, choose life. He says, life and death are set before thee. Choose what? Life. That means live. When you have an open-ended choice, we always seem to go opposite of God. Everything was made to praise God, to please God. Satan knows the vulnerability of our, of our will. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Satan knows the vulnerability of our will. Satan knows our frame. He's not stupid. We're made in the image of God. We're made in the image of God. But yet we're not God. Which means we have, a, we have what's in us the desire to worship. Satan knows that. He's not stupid. We know that. We're not stupid. Okay, It's not like... Oh, secret handshake. How did you find this out? We have a spy. Oh, we got a mole. No, it's probably, it was publicly understood that we have, a, we have a will, and it can be used against us. This will is our flesh. It can be used against us. Genesis chapter 3, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the, fruit, of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as what? As gods, knowing good and evil. We have, and we're made in God's image. Right? He's tapping into this knowledge that we're supposed to have, but he doesn't go truthfully. He does it with deceit, which trips him up. But Satan knew the vulnerability, the weak spot of our will. Our flesh knows the volition of our will. Our flesh knows the volition. He knows what our default setting is going to be. Romans chapter 1. So Satan knows we have a weak spot. Our flesh knows the vulnerability or our vol volition that is, in, that is our will. Romans chapter 7, verse 21 it says this, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. He says, I desire the law, of, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. The inward man wants to serve God. The inward man wants to read his Bible. The inward man wants to go so many. The inward man wants to live a pure life. The inward man doesn't want to cuss. The inward man doesn't want to listen to wrong music. The inward man doesn't want to lust with our eyes. The inward man doesn't want the things of the world. The inward man wants to serve, please God. This is born of God. That which is, in, that which is born of God 
doth not, he does not commit sin, right? So this inward man within us, it just it does not want to sin. It does not want to, it wants to serve God. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Paul says, O wretched man that I am, who should deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. So in my mind, even with the volition, I know that my will is going to be by default to go against God. And he called himself wretched. Even though he said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ with me. He's the one that said, hey, but they glorified God in me. He's the one that said, I want to know Christ and the power of his suffering. He's the one that said, I want to grow. I want to press toward the mark. He's the one that said, I want to please God with everything I have. But he also says in his heart and mind and life, he says, there's still within me in my will, there's still this, this there's still a propensity, oh, there's a propensity to still do wrong. And it's because our flesh knows the um the the volition that is our will. And the flesh will always, our flesh will always be by default against God. That's why we have the allegory between Sinai, between you know, um, oh wow. Jacob and Esau, we see that war constantly going at it, right? We see that, uh, uh, Jacob, and we see it in Genesis, there you go, Galatians. We see that war going constantly within us. God knows the volume of our will. God knows how much our will will be. How God knows what our pressure points are. That's why we know that God come, gives a commandment, and he's oftentimes he's, for, he's able to forgive us. Even when we break, we, we sin, and we mess up, and we're with God, there's plenty of mercy, there's forgiveness, and he's plenteous in mercy because we fail all the time. But God knows the volume of our will. God also, now here's the thing, our soul, our soul, that's the part that's been redeemed, right? It's been saved. That's why we go soul winning. The soul of man, that's been redeemed. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 21. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. This is, the, this is what our soul is, right? It's, it says that the earnest expectation of the creature, that's the soul deep within us, it's yearning, it's crying, our spirit bears with us, this spirit, we're the sons of God, we want out of this world. And he understands that our soul knows that our, that our will is vanity. We'll never be able to withstand against God. Can, a, can the clay say to his, to his maker, why hast thou made me thus? Can we honestly say to God, why have you done this to me? Who do you think you are, God? No, of course not. So he says, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into his glorious liberty of the children of God. Christ redeems our soul, not our will. Our will is unredeemable. That's why our will has to be broken. That's why with kids, their will has to be broken. By the way, can I give you something, some words and nuggets in the future when you do have kids? Don't be afraid to spank the kid. And if you do it within the first couple, within the first two years of life, and you're able to spank them the first three years of life, and you're able to spank them properly and discipline them and give them structure, when they turn six or seven or even 11, you won't have hardly as bad of a time breaking their will. They're more pliable. You find a young lady and her will is, she can't ever be corrected. You find a guy who takes correction, you, you know, he gets corrected at work or he gets corrected by the preaching or whatever it may be, and, and God be by God, he gets corrected by God, and he bu he bucks, he bucks, he bucks up to God, he bows, he hardens his neck, he bows up, he gets stiff, and who do you think you are? And he gets defiant. The reason why is because the spirit was never in check. His his will has got to be busted. He's got to break his will. Christ redeems our soul, but not our will. Our soul knows the vanity of of our will. He remember he says this, God knoweth he knoweth our frame that we are what? But dust. He knows what we're about. It's not just talking about our physical body, although yes, our body will turn to dust, but he even looks at the vanity of our will because nothing can withstand God very long. Canaanites said no to God. Uh, we're not leaving, we're not leaving the land. And God says, "Yes, you are." And they said, "No, you won't." So God says, "Okay." And he sends hornets. And what did the hornets do? Gave them the bee's knees, right? Okay, I'll be high. They went and drove them out of the land. 
drove them out. God doesn't, there's a song that says God doesn't change our, he doesn't make us go against our will, but he sure makes us willing to go. Our will is stubborn, and it must be brought under subjection. And we find that with, with Paul. He says the weapon, you know, it's the pulling down our strongholds. It's We have to submit ourselves to the Lord. We have to say yes to him. We have to crucify that flesh, flesh and, and die daily. But you find this with the creation. You find these things within it. There's the reason of our of, of creation. We find the conflict for creation. And it's always been this way. Satan knows it. He knows our vulnerability. And he's always going against it. If you study out how Satan tried tempting Christ, he tempted Christ against his will. But lo, in the volume of the book it is written, I come to do thy will. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thy will be done. I came to do the will of him that sent me. Right? So Christ had, had his will submitted. Christ already knew. And it wasn't like Christ was sinful. I'm not saying, Christ, I'm not saying that. But I am saying that, he, that Christ was in tune with the, Lord, with the Father's will. And his will had been submitted to the Lord, showing us that same example that we can follow in his steps. So the cause of creation is for worship. That's why when Satan was tempting Christ, what was he tempting him to do? Fall down and worship me. It's for the cause of worship. Let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. Please him. How do we please him? By faith. How do we please him? Do the things that please the Father. How do we please him? In him. In him. You know, all, you know, he, he, he's... Wow, my mind just went blank. But yeah, please the Lord. And that's our that's our whole purpose of creation. So and that's just thing gleaning from Genesis. When he creates us in the image of God, he creates us with a purpose to serve and worship the Lord. Don't let anything stop that. Don't let anything hinder that from that. But that's Genesis chapter 1. Hope it helps. But um, I thought I was reading through that this past, I don't know, past month or so, reading through Genesis. And I figured I'll put something together. But there's gleanings from Genesis chapter 1. Hope it's been a blessing. Hope it's encouraging to you. But it's awesome to look at back at what the Lord has done, and there's nothing left undone. He didn't leave it for big. He didn't leave it up to Big Bang. And I don't have to preach a creation sermon, but you know, against evolution. But he he prepared it. That's what he did with his own hands. Not only did he speak it, but he rolled up his sleeves and did it. So it shows follow through on God's part. All right, let's take some time and pray.